Hey, do you guys remember that one time when Fisher Tiger climbed the entire red line with his bare hands, armed up with a bunch of pistols, swords, and a giant bazooka on his back, barged into the Holy Land, burned the entire town down, shot a bunch of people, freed a bunch of slaves, and got out completely fine? Because I think about that daily. I don't know about you, but I think about that daily, okay? Uh, actually, even more so. Actually, I have been thinking about that daily because of recent events in One Piece. So, we're going to be talking about Fisher Tiger today. And so, for example, when they were talking about all the different times that Marijois was breached, they mentioned that Marijois was attacked by the Iron Giant 200 years ago. And then we also learned about the God's Knights, and we know Kuma's attacking right now. We know Fisher Tiger attacked uh, over a decade ago when he breached the gates and got in there. He climbed the entire wall, and then he freed a bunch of slaves, and then he escaped. So, what actually happened was Fisher Tiger was captured when he was out exploring because he was just an adventurer. He wasn't a pirate or anything like that. He was just an adventurer, but he was captured at one point and brought to Marijois as a slave. He was able to escape by himself, just him alone. He was able to break out of his shackles, run away, probably just dive off the red line and he managed to get away. However, before he went back home to Fishman Island, he was like, I can't just, you know, I can't just let all those slaves up there, you know, being tortured and humiliated and, you know, under the thumb of the Tenerubito. I, I have to do something. I have to go back and at least try try to save as many as I can. So that's when he went away for a little while, nursed his wounds, armed up, got, I went to a gun shop, I don't know, I would like your largest bazooka, please. You know, grab that, and then he went all the way back up the red line and attacked the place, and wh every time we see the flashback, it's always like a bunch of fire, so I don't know, he probably picked up a bunch of Molotov cocktails along the way and was just chucking them around the Holy Land and just like, come on, be free! You know, just like liberating as many slaves as he could, and he managed to get out of there without any serious injuries, you know? Um, so that happened, right? And then with the most recent chapter, we had Kuma attacking, and then Akainu was the one that stopped him. So, because we now know that the God's Knights exist, uh, we know a little bit more about them as well. Like, remember, Dragon specifically said that he was worried about the God's Knights getting involved. So the God's Knights are clearly not just some kind of judiciary body that exists to judge Tenerubito. Like, we know that is one of their functions, because Saint Garling, uh, part of the Figarland family, was uh, the one that actually judged Mulesguard and killed him and executed Mulesguard. Like, he's dead. Okay, so that is one of their functions whenever there's a dispute amongst world nobles the gods knights interfere But dragon was genuinely worried about them like attacking like mobilizing and fighting and dragon was worried like okay The real fight starts now. We're gonna have to deal with these guys. Okay, and the gods knights aren't to be messed with so because Oda is very clearly referencing these this new group that had previously never really been mentioned before, I think the first time the God's Knights were mentioned was uh, during the Wano arc, during the interlude between Acts, I think it was between Act 1 and, and 2, or between Act 2 or 3, one of them, where Akainu mentioned, like, oh yeah, the, the God's Knights, they're going to deal with the whole situation with Charlos and Mulesguard. That was the first time they were mentioned in the story, and then now we got actual introduction to one of them, St. Garling and everything like that. So we know they're a force to be reckoned with. Now, how strong are they? That's not really a debate for this video. I did another video on that. You can have a discussion on where the God's Knights lie in terms of like, you know, one of them is as strong as an Admiral, or all of them together are stronger than a Yonko, or three of them are as strong as a Yonko. Whatever. You can have that power scaling discussion. I don't care. Um, th at least there's nine of them. We know that. We saw the silhouette. We saw one little silhouette when Dragon was talking about them. We know there's at least nine, uh, although we did not see the outline of St. Garling in that um, silhouette. So it might be nine God's Knights, and then St. Garling is like their commander or whatever. So it might be ten. It might just be an even ten. Keep it simple, like the Espada or something like that, right? Okay. My question is, and going back to the Fisher Tiger conundrum, what has to happen before the God's Knights do stuff, all right? Like, seriously, at first, at first, I just assumed... Anything that happened in the lower realm, the God's Knights did not give a shit about. Because they clearly do not get involved with stuff in the lower realm. Alright? It doesn't matter if a Yonko is attacking Marineford, they're not going to get involved. It doesn't matter if a Warlord is attacking an entire nation, like with Doflamingo and Dressrosa, or Crocodile at Alabasta. They do not care. They're not going to get involved. Alright? So I'm like, okay, that's fair. That's what the Marines are for. That's what Cypher Pole is for. Fine. Clearly, the God's Knights get involved only when there's a direct threat on Marijois itself, where the Tenryobito live. 
Nope, not true, because, well, okay, we don't know much about the Iron Giant incident other than the fact it occurred 200 years ago, which, by the way, also happened to coincide with the moment when uh, fishmen were actually given rights. Um, now, there's still a lot of racism and slavery in the One Piece world about fishmen and merfolk, but before 200 years ago, they weren't even classified as, like, you know, autonomous, sentient life. They were just classified as fish and nothing more. 200 years ago, that changed. We still don't know the full story about that so Oda's gonna have to clarify that but we know the Iron Giant climbed the mountain and it seemed to be like before it really did any serious damage it ran out of power and it just kind of collapsed and so then they just kind of threw it in the scrapyard and it eventually ended up at Egghead um but yeah so so you could maybe argue all right God's Knights didn't really need to get involved with that because the Iron Giant showed up and was about to attack but then like like turned off okay but three incidents as of late, where Marijua has been directly attacked by an outside entity. First time, well, not really recent, but within the last decade or so, relative to 200 years ago, Fisher Tiger attacked Marijua. Okay, straight up. Just scaled the walls, started burning down the city. He didn't burn down the whole thing, but there's a lot of fire. He set fire to a lot of things, probably setting off explosives and everything. He was armed up. Any guard that came after him, he shot them dead, you know, probably killed and injured a lot of people. And then just going on and just liberated as many slaves as he could, regardless of whether they were fishmen, merfolk, long leg, long arm humans, did not care. Boa Hancock and her uh, two siblings, Sanderzonia and Marigold were part of that, as well as Koala was one of the slaves that got away there. He liberated a bunch of slaves, which is the which at the time, you know, were considered like, oh, the Tenorbito owned the slaves. No, they're taking away our property, right? And so Fisher Tiger did all of that and was able to get away stop free. Like, he got back to Fish, Fishman Island, and he didn't seem all that injured. It wasn't like he, he missed a, a leg or an arm, or he got, like, some serious internal injury. Like, like the God's Knights came out, and like, Fisher Tiger, we will not allow you to do this insolence against the Tenerubito. On guard! And then, you know, Fisher Tiger had to fight against Shanks' hot sister or something. I'm not letting that go! When we finally get introduced to the God's Knights, if, if Shanks' hot sister is not part of that group, I'm gonna be very disappointed, Oda, okay? All right, anyway, um, they didn't they didn't apparently get involved, and that's a victory for Fisher Tiger. That's not even like, well, Fisher Tiger didn't really get that far in his invasion. No, that was a successful attack on Marijua. He showed up, he rolled up, burned the place down, killed a bunch of people, liberated a bunch of slaves, skipped out. That's a success. That's a sound defeat for Marijua on that one, okay? He made it out fine, okay? <laughs> to have a very successful pirate career afterwards, actually. Oh my god. So, I can only assume the God's Knights did not get involved with that. I can also assume that it's not something similar to what happened with Kuma, where the Fleet Admiral got involved. The Fleet Admiral, back in the day when Fisher Tiger uh, raided Marijua, that would have most likely still have been Sengoku. I, I don't think it was Kong. Kong would have been the Fleet Admiral. He was the Fleet Admiral when, like, Roger was executed. And I think it was shortly after that that Sengoku became Fleet Admiral. So I'm pretty sure Sengoku was still the Fleet Admiral. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the alarm didn't get raised. It is a thing to mention that when Kuma scaled the red line, he landed at the red port and started climbing up and everybody like uh, like sounded the alarm and knew he was there and knew he was going to attack Marijua, or at least he was heading to Marijua. So they had time to like call up Akainu, the fleet admiral, and be like, hey, you need to come stop this guy. Fisher Tiger, on the other hand, though, he might have been a lot more methodical and tactical about this. He probably didn't scale the red line right at the red port, which is the place where all the marines and all the guards and sirens were at. Uh, Fisher Tiger, being a fish man, he would probably be loaded up on all of his gear, and then under cover of night, he would have found a, you know, a desolate, you know, deserted spot in the red line, popped out of the water, and just made that entire climb all the way up. We still do not know how tall the red line is from sea level all the way up to the top. We, we know from sea level to Fishman Island, that's 10,000 meters. Okay, we do know that. We don't know how much from sea level up to the top of Marijua, okay? I assume it's just shy of entering uh, the White Sea and the you know, Sky Islands and stuff like that. White Sea is 7,000 meters up, so I'm assuming it's somewhere between five to 7,000 meters up is the top of Marijua, okay? 
just for simplicity's sake, so they're not, like, in the White Sea itself. It's slightly below that, okay? But still, that's, like, 5,000. You want to lowball it and say maybe, like, 4,000, 5,000 meters tall. That's still a hell of a climb. But he made it to the top, and then he just owned the place. He was probably very tactical. Like I said, he was very, like, he wasn't just, like, barging right into the main gates and then just started raiding the place. He was, like, under cover of night. He reached, like, a spot, like, away from Marijois on the surface, and then he, like, went into the town and just started blowing stuff up and, you know, just, like, executing guards and shit and eventually got to the point where it was just like the whole place was on fire and everyone was like raising the alarm so they did not have time to summon like oh we need to get the admirals up here we need to get the fleet admiral up here we need to get cypher pull zero mobilized like they just probably did not have time because fisher tiger just really hit him where it hurt and he he had been a slave there for years so he kind of knew the layout and where everything was at so he probably knew the best place to sneak in and everything like that and they didn't expect that that's the last place you know the tenorubito and the guards expect to be attacked by anybody because geography is everything. So it's at the top of the red line, right? Those guards, probably most of the time when Reverie's not going on, are probably very lazy. Like the cone-headed guards are probably just like, oh man, hey Bill, how you doing? Oh, hey Greg, you became a cone-head guard just like me. Yeah, man, I love this job. Nothing to do for, you know, Reverie shows up. It kind of gets a little bit intense and everything. Got to be on your toes. But beyond Reverie, man, you get to just hang out and read the paper, mess around on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's nothing going on up here. You know, there's like, who's going to attack Marie Joie? Nobody, that's who. And then that's when Fisher Tiger shows up behind him and just <laughs> slits their freaking throats and then like, knocks them down. And then that's when the attack happens. All right. So there was a show about it, though. It, it did end up with a huge fire and everybody's running around in chaos. So if you assume that the... Uh, well, first of all, you assume the commander-in-chief, who would have been Kong at this point, was also living in Castle Pangea. He would have maybe got involved. But you also understand, like, if the God's Knights are living in the Divine Domain, why didn't they do anything? <laughs> So this is up to Oda. This is up to Oda now. This is a question I have, and this might even be something that gets brought up in the SBS, honestly, because it is kind of a glaring thing. And then later, we have the revolutionaries attacking the city, uh, setting more fires, destroying the granaries, burning the Celestial Dragon symbol, and skipping out with a bunch of escaped slaves as well. And then Kuma just attacked. None of these incidents, none of them, the Iron Giant incident, Fisher Tiger attacking, the revolutionaries burning all the granaries and destroying all the food supply and everything like that, and um, Kuma attacking. None of these incidents, four that we know of, were attacks on Marijua directly resulted in the God's Knights doing anything. They just let it happen. So... That means a couple of things. If to, In order to make sense out of all this, because you can't just say like, oh, the God's Knights were out of town that day. They live there. That's that's where they live, okay? They live at Marijua, right? That's where they're stationed, all right? And we know from Dragon, they are a physical threat. They are powerful. So the only way this makes sense is if they were simply ordered to not get involved. That is the only way this makes sense uh, thematically. Because otherwise it'd be like, so they're just not getting involved with any of these attacks? No, it might be a thing where they are only, they only listen, not even maybe to the Goro say, they might only take orders from Eam and Eam alone, and that is it, okay? Maybe they have like standing orders and duties, like the judiciary stuff, like, you know, oh, whenever there's a dispute between world nobles, they'll get involved there. But when it comes to mobilizing as a fighting force, as like a military unit, Eam and Eam alone is the only person that gives those orders. Maybe the Goro say as well, but Eam might be the only one, right? So, like, when the Iron Giant attacked, like, it ran out of battery power before it could actually attack, like, the castle. But I feel like if that Iron Giant reached Castle Pangea and started ripping it apart, like, climbing on top of the castle and, like, you know, dismantling it, I have a feeling Eam would probably have something to say about that, right? But the Iron Giant incident kind of ended quickly, all right? Fisher Tiger, what if when he attacked Marijua, he wasn't going after the castle? His beef was with the Celestial Dragon City, the domain of the gods, because that's where most of the slaves were kept. Most of the slaves are kept, like, under the city with, like, the travel vaders, like, forced to run those, or they're in the personal houses, the mansions of the Tenerubito, in the domain of the gods, okay, where the Tenerubito live, that's obviously makes sense where most of their slaves would be kept. So what if 
Fisher Tiger, when he attacked, he didn't give a shit about Castle Pangea. He didn't even bother going over there. He barged through the gate, or he, like, hopped the gate, or whatever. He figured out a way inside. He dug underneath it, whatever he did. He got into the domain of the gods, and that's when he started the chaos, right? Now, you got the cone-headed guards, you got Cypherpool that might have gotten involved at that time, that that generation of Zero, you know, they might have gotten involved, right? And I could imagine, Fisher Tiger was a badass, man, he was a certified badass, if you haven't figured out already. So I think, I think, you know, if Cypherpool Zero, like one or two agents of Cypherpool attacked Fisher Tiger, I feel like he could, he could ward them off, he would have been okay with that, right? Uh, you know, Fisher Tiger was really strong. So, it might have been a thing where Eam and the Gorosei were aware of this, they could just look out the window and see this giant plume of smoke coming from the domain of the gods like oh my god goro say you know the, 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 the yeah that's what he said you know but now so it's like soldier calm down tell me what happened it's like oh sorry uh fisher tiger is attacking he's burning the entire domain of the gods down he's freeing all the slaves he's shooting the guards what do we do sir and, um, you know they might have mobilized more guards or whatever but when it came to the gods knights maybe eam was just like he's not after the castle is he he's like no He's not barging into Castle Pangea, right? No. All right. I'm not mobilizing the God's Knights. Screw it. He's like, but he might burn the whole city down. It's like, mm, send the guards. You know? It might be a thing where, um, E might have even viewed it as, like, who cares? Like, oh, he's gonna free some slaves. E might have been like, mm. Not because Eam is altruistic or against slavery or anything. Eam is like the 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 effective dictator of the entire world government. So I, I, it might not be an interest of that. Like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, let him free the slaves. You know, I was against slavery the whole thing. No, it might have been a thing where Eam just doesn't care. He's just like, oh, the world nobles are losing losing some of their slaves. I don't care. I don't care. He's not coming right after me. He's not trying to barge into the castle. So whatever. That might have been a thing with Fisher Tiger. Same thing with the Revolutionary Army. They weren't attacking the castle. Sabo got into the castle to try to free Kuma. He got into the castle, sure. And we saw Eames' reaction to Sabo, like, Ugh! you know? But when it came to the rest of the Revolutionary Army commanders attacking the city, God's Knights didn't get involved there, right? And then the last attack was Kuma. Kuma, once again, he was intercepted by Akainu because, like I said, they knew Kuma was coming so they could have time to get Akainu, get their guard dog ready to fight, right? So, uh, yeah. It might be a thing that, like, unless that foreign, uh, you know, invader, that force, gets into the castle itself, the God's Knights don't care, you know? And if Sabo would have maybe stuck around in the castle longer than he did... Oh, that still doesn't make sense, because, well... So Sabo got into the castle, all the way into the throne room. He snuck all the way in there. Apparently, once again, I guess... Do the God's Knights not have observation hockey? I guess Sabo is really good at stealth. Sabo is really good at sneaking around, but is he that good at sneaking around? If the God's Knights are stationed in Castle Pangea, it's like, okay, he was able to sneak past all of them, and then he got into the throne room with Eam, and then Eam got enraged, and Sabo still managed to escape. And uh, the God's Knights, like, Eam wouldn't have said, like, summon the God's Knights, stop him! You know? So that means either, once again, the God's Knights did not get involved, or Sabo was able just to be so good at escaping, he got through, even after being critically wounded by Eam, he was still able to get away. I'm just, I'm just, I, I would say that's more of the issue rather than the God's Knights not attacking during Fisher Tiger or the Revolutionary burning the city or Kuma. I would say that. It's the fact that Sabo got out of that castle in one piece. I guess he wasn't in one piece. He did get attacked. He did get stabbed by Eam, and it looked pretty painful. But, because, like, that's the thing that would happen. Like, Cobra was like, was like, oh, Sabo, you must escape. You know, tell my daughter I love her. I will stop him. And so Cobra, like, threw himself in front of the Gorose and Eam, providing Sabo a way to escape. But we don't really see, we didn't really see what happened after that. So wait, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight for a moment, all right? Sabo is critically injured after getting stabbed by Eam. They're in the throne room, which I can only assume is like really high up in the castle, right? It's not like on the first floor, right? A wounded and elderly and sick old man, Cobra, is like, Sabo, I'll buy you time to escape. And then he like throws his arms in front of them. And then Cobra buys more than enough time. Like, the Garosei and Eam could have killed Cobra in less than a second. They could have just, like, cut off his head and called it a day. In fact, I think that is what they might have done. But it's like, yeah, they could have just... Cobra... Cobra... My point is, the amount of time that Cobra could have bought Sabo is less than five seconds. 
Probably less than a second. He's an old man. He's like, get away! One attack would be enough. And then Sabo still managed to get out the door, down the hallway, down the flight of stairs, like barge through a window, into the grounds of Castle Pangea, and then escape after that, jump down the red line, and manage to get to a boat and escape. Sabo's... Sabo's really good at this secret agent shit. He's a revolutionary. I'm just saying, it's just like, wow. He was able to get through everybody, huh? The Gorosei, Eam, and all of the God's Knights who are apparently supposed to be the biggest of badasses at Marijua. He was able to escape all of them, huh? I need some explanation on this, Oda. I need some elucidation on this. I definitely do, all right? Well, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up today. That was, that was something that gets brought up every once in a while. People will comment, like, Wait, what do the God's Knights do? What, like, what has to happen before the God's Knights do anything? You know, because you might say, like, threatening Eames existence but Sabo kind of did that also Wapple he was able to escape too <laughs> it really just seems like uh, a lot of the uh, higher ups in the world government are kind of incompetent <laughs> you know what I mean all right well I guess we'll find out but let me know what you think down below about all that I do not have yellow jacket facts for you today I'm sorry about that uh, I was actually thinking the chapter was going to be out today but it is not out yet although probably by the time I get this video uploaded that's what always happens I'll upload this video and then the chapter will be out but uh, if the chapter's out tomorrow, I'll review it then. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching signing out. Let me know how you feel about this. Hmm.